time. Uh, tonight we come to the letter to the Ephesians. And this is a uh, favorite book for many, and for good reason. Uh, we're still working our way through Paul's letters, his 13 letters in the New Testament. And Paul wrote this one, uh, if you remember, Galatians was written in the 40s. Uh, Ephesians comes along in the early 60s. So Paul is quite a bit older. He's been in ministry quite a bit longer. He is more seasoned. And that doesn't mean that Ephesians is better than Galatians, because the Bible tells us in Second Peter that everyone who contributed to the Bible, Peter says, was carried along by the Holy Spirit and wrote exactly what God wanted to write. But just thinking about Paul's life, Paul is quite a bit older, and he's been in ministry, as I said. He's gone on to other places. And when Paul writes Ephesians, he tells us in chapter 6 that he's in prison. He says, I'm an ambassador in chains. So he's literally sitting in a prison cell as he's writing this, which is helpful to keep in mind as we think about some of the things he talks about. He's going to talk about triumphing. He's going to talk about uh, trusting in God's sovereignty no matter what. And if you, if you think about the fact that he's in prison while he's saying these, these things, it helps to kind of process, you know, he's, he's living what he's teaching. Uh, the main idea you can see there, Paul's trying to communicate to the church in Ephesus that Christ Jesus has reconciled all creation to himself and to God. He's, you, uh, Christ Jesus has united people from all nations to himself and to one another. I think I've said before in here that, that when we are saved, we are not just reconciled to God. We are reconciled to God and into his church. So you can't have one without the other. And that's what Paul is talking about here. He says the the great deeds, these great deeds were accomplished through the powerful, sovereign, free working of the triune God. So how is it that Jesus unites all people together and reconciles sinners to God and to one another? It happens by the work of God alone. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are all active, and it is God's work alone. Uh, these works are recognized and received by faith alone through God's grace. And in light of these great truths, Christians are to lead lives that are, that are a fitting tribute of gratitude to our Lord. You ever, when you evangelize somebody or you're talking to God about somebody, do you ever say, believing in God costs you something? Now, in other parts of the world, that may be more readily true. If you convert and some parts of the Middle East or in China or some, some places in South America, it can cost you your physical safety, uh, even your own life. But here, even while we don't face persecution like that, believing in God does still cost you something. Because one of the things that Ephesians makes clear is that God expects you to bring your life into line with his word. There's a, there's a, the, salvation is not just getting the list of beliefs in the right order and saying, yes, I got that down. Salvation changes us, and to use Paul's words, from a dead person to a living person. And then God says, once that has happened, there's an expectation with the Holy Spirit working in you that you walk a certain kind of life, that you stop sinning, and that you start, uh, you start moving towards or pursuing righteousness. And he makes that clear in here. And so in light of what we know God to have done, in light of who we know God to be, Paul says we ought to live a certain way on purpose. So why James will say in James chapter 1, verse 20, that we ought not to get angry. Right? Anger seems like such a normal response. It just seems like the right thing to do. Anger, you know, there's no more uh, justifying emotion than anger. Anger always convinces you that you're right no matter what's going on. I'm right. I feel that I'm right. I know that I'm right as a matter of fact, and you guys ought to see that I'm right. But believing in God drives me to see in his word that James 1.20 says, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So it costs me something. And that, that something in that instance might be feeling like I won that argument or not getting the last word or not wounding my opponent by what I say. So Paul says we ought to bring our lives into line with who God is and what he said. Uh, you can see that the outline there, pretty simple. It breaks right in half real neatly. And unlike 
Corinthians and Galatians, Ephesians does not deal with a specific issue in the church. The Corinthian church was broken. Not only did they need one letter, we talked about they needed four because they were just messed up. The Galatians had abandoned the gospel and were listening to false teachers, and so Paul is writing to them, rebuking them, dealing with those specific issues. But with the church in Ephesus, we're not, it doesn't appear that there's any specific sin or specific issue that Paul is, is dealing with. It's really this theological letter about how good, how great, how glorious God is and what that means for us. Um, if you know the Bible at all, you'll know from both Acts and the letters of First and Second Timothy that after Paul planted the church in Ephesus, he leaves Timothy behind to pastor this church. So he's writing back to his intern, essentially, that he is raised up in the faith, that he's equipped to be an elder and overseer of the Ephesian church. And so he's writing back to this young pastor that he raised up. So I just noted we're not exactly sure what prompted Paul to write the letter other than the Holy Spirit, but we, are so, we ought to be so thankful that he did. And we talked about with Corinthians, we're missing two of the four letters, probably out of God's kindness. And Paul probably think is, is thankful for that too because he said, and I wrote a, a harsh letter. But for whatever reason, God prompted Paul to write this letter. And just like all 66 books in the Bible, we ought to be very thankful that Paul sat down to write this. Um, Paul has two primary points. He wants us to know what God has done and he wants us to know what are we supposed to do about it. What has God done in salvation and then how do we respond? Because it's not just to say, do you believe this? Paul says, if you understand what God has done, then you will change. You will be changed by the Holy Spirit, but you will be given new desires to change further. Which is why over in, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, Paul says to the Philippian church, work out you all's salvation with fear and trembling. He doesn't mean finish it, he means exercise it. And the you there is the second person plural, which we would translate as y'all. Y'all, together as the church, exercise your faith together. Because it's not just something we believe in our minds, it's something that we understand and hold to that then becomes a way of living. So I noted there, it breaks into two parts um, about God and the church. The pastor said in the first three chapters, Paul does not instruct his readers to do anything. Think about that. In Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, Paul does not give one command. He just spends that time explaining what God has done. Now, he's not even really talking about who God is. Now, we see different characteristics of God come out, but he is talking about what God has done. He talks about what God is like. He talks about uh, who we are and what we are. And he lays out the framework for these Christians to help them understand everything from the whole world down to themselves and ultimately God. And all of Paul's theology happens in this order. You can, you can say it, you can use the, the fancy words, it happens, um, uh, I left my mind, it's right there in my notes, indicative to imperative, which means Paul is going to indicate something, and then he's going to give us a command based on that. He's going to say, here's what's true, and then he's going to say, now here's what you do because of what's true. And that's the same way it is in all of Paul's 13 letters. He never just comes along and says, you ought to do this. He says, always, Based on these truths about God, now you ought to do this. And that's so important. Because if I'm going to live a life that honors and glorifies God, I can't start with just an effort to do it. I've got to know who God is and what actually glorifies Him. I've got to know what actually honors Him. I've got to know what is actually obedient to Him. Otherwise, and this happens all the time, Otherwise, I'm going to be trying my hardest and doing my best, and I may be way off in left field, violating God's word and not know about it. But I'll feel great about it. I'll still call myself a Christian. Churches find themselves in this situation all the time. Think about the, the churches in Revelation. They considered themselves churches, and yet they were the furthest thing from it. And Paul says, if, if we're going to act rightly, if I'm going to actually live out my Christian life in an obedient way, it starts with knowing who God is and what God has 
done. And so that's where Paul starts. And so he lists several things that are true about God in these first three chapters. And the first one he starts with is that God elects, that God chooses his people, that he moves to save those whom he chooses. Now, that ought not to be surprising at this point. Paul wrote a lengthy treatise about this in Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. But Paul makes the point here again. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1, if you have your Bible open. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fulfillment of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Just as a fun Bible Trivia piece. This is the longest sentence in the Bible. (laughs) In the Greek, it's actually one long sentence from verse 3 down to verse 10. It's 200 and some words, and it's all one sentence. So when you translate it in Greek, if you do that, it's a lot of fun. But he's making an argument the whole time. And the argument he's making is, God did this, God did this, God did this, and if you missed it, God did this. He says that over and over and over again. He makes that point over and over that God elects. And so as is pretty, pretty prominent in most of his letters, he greets them and he greets them, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. Sometimes he'll say a bond servant of Christ Jesus or a slave of Christ Jesus. But here he says, he's an apostle of Christ Jesus by what? The will of God. So he says, I didn't choose this. And if we know Paul's life, we know Paul is actually choosing to persecute the church, right? He was choosing to put Christians to death. He was trying to stomp out the church of Jesus Christ. But he says, I'm an apostle of Christ Jesus, not because I chose it, but by the will of God. And so he says, it's no accident. It's no accident that I'm an apostle. Nor is his ministry in Ephesus accidental. Then in in, in, in verses 3 through 14, Paul praises God for election. He says it's a good thing. It's a glorious thing. We ought to think about it. We ought to know about it. And the more we think about it and know about it, it turns our hearts and our minds into praising God. Now, I know for a lot of people, historically, now, and in the future, election can be a hard doctrine to come across. And yet, Paul says it ought to evoke praise in us. It ought, to, it ought to evoke uh, wondrous uh, thoughts of God's glory as to what he has done for us. And so he talks about how God elects all Christians for redemption in Christ in chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. When he uses the, the, the pronoun us, such as in verse 3, where he says, um, God has blessed us in Christ, he's talking about the church there. We need to understand, God, Paul is not writing to, to everybody, every person, everywhere. He's writing to specifically the Christians in the Ephesian church in the early 60s. But he's also, by the Holy Spirit's oversight, writing to every Christian everywhere throughout all time. And so the us that he's talking about is the church. So if you are in Christ Jesus through repenting of your sins and trusting in his death, burial, and resurrection, that's you. This is your testimony. Always encourage people when they talk about sharing their testimonies. Find a passage of scripture that speaks about your life. And that's your testimony. I always found mine, I think it's in Luke, where it says, as Jesus came along, he called Levi, and Levi got up and followed him. I said, that's my testimony. 
that Jesus came along, changed my life, and I followed. And here again, Paul is saying that the, uh, who do you need me to get? Which one? You? Tim? All right. I guess everything's all right. I'll let us know if it's not. Um, the us is the church. Paul's talking about all Christians throughout all time. So as I said, this is our testimony. God's sovereignty is shining, literally from Paul's writings, and we're seeing it really shining through election. He's saying, if, we, if you want to understand God's sovereignty, one of the ways that we see that most is God's choosing of his people even before the world began. I mean, you think about, think about how, how amazing, how mind-boggling that statement is. Not just before you were born, but God had chosen you, if you are in Christ, before the world was formed. Now, that tells us something about who God is and how God exists outside of time and space and those things. But Paul says that ought to, that ought to create wonder in us, that God does that he works everything according to the counsel of his will. That's what he says in verse 11. God's not consulting with somebody. God's not following a plan that was laid out for him. It says he's doing all this according to the counsel and the purpose of his will. And I think we talked about, I think we did, uh, that the only true, truly free will in existence is God's. The Bible says my will is confined by sin, that my will is broken by sin, but God acts in accordance with his will because everything he does is perfect and right and because he is God. And so Paul is making that point right from the get-go, and the reason he makes that point is so that we understand no one, no human has a right to be saved. Nobody can look at God and say, you have to save me. Nobody can look at God and say, if you make a choice, it's unfair, Because Paul says it's all from God and it's his anyway. Salvation is totally from God. And when we understand that salvation happens, it's a free act of God that comes from him. And so salvation through election is a divine privilege, Paul says, that comes through the overflow of God's grace. When God saves a sinner... It's because God's gracious mercy is overflowing into that person's life. And Paul says that ought to to stop us in our tracks. But in verses 15 through 23, Paul prays something. He prays something for this church. Look at your Bibles, verse 15. Paul says, For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Now listen to what he prays for. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you, what are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe." that we might know according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he wants us to know that God put everything under Jesus' feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, and the church is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now think about that. Paul is just praying that the church would know these things. That's what he says. I'm praying that the Holy Spirit would grant you an understanding of this. I pray that the Holy Spirit would help you to see all of this is from God. All of this is through knowing him through his word. Paul prays in verse 18, I pray that the, the eyes of your heart would be enlightened. What were the problems in the churches in Revelation? Do you remember how Jesus closed every letter? He who has ears to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's what Paul is saying here. That you might have your soul awakened to who God is and to what God does so that you might live rightly. Rightly. 
That's all he's praying for, that we would know God. There are so many people who are frustrated in their faith or who are frustrated reading the Bible or are frustrated in their lives because they have an idea about God that's not right. We are really good, you and I as humans, we're really good at making up ideas about God that don't come from here. And we've talked about that. Culture makes up all kinds of beliefs about God. God is only love, right? Or uh, hate the, hate the, love the sinner, hate the sin. Right? That's, a, that's a false idea. Psalms very clearly says God hates sin and sinners if we are not in Christ. There's so many people that are frustrated because they have wrong ideas about God, and that translates into a wrong way of living. And Paul says, I pray that you know God. I pray that you know who he is. I pray that you know how he works. I pray that you know what he's done so that you can live a life of faith. So, so many people, I note there, try to work for God without taking the time, excuse me, <clears throat> taking the time to get to know God. They want to work for him without getting to know him. You know, a husband's primary duty is not just to do things around the house, it's to know his wife. And, but so many people get that backwards when it comes to being religious. They want to make sure they're checking off the religious checklist. I've gone to church, I've read my Bible, I've done my devotion, I'm, uh, you know, I'm doing whatever. But they don't know God. And Paul says, I pray, I pray, I pray that you know God. That you know him through his word. So that you then live out a life that is rewarding, that is full of joy, that is full of unity. I pray that you know God. I'm pretty terrible at time management. That's frustrating. All right, I'm pick up the pace. So God elects, he says God unites. In chapter three, Paul talks about how the gospel has come from the Jews to the Gentiles, and that's God's will, and it's done through Jesus Christ. He points, to, uh, he points to how God is doing this. Chapter 2, verse 13, he says, You who were once far off have now been brought near. Talking about the Gentiles. And that that wasn't them working their way into unity in the church. It was God went and got them. And then God unites. God elects. God brings his church together. He unites. And in chapter 2, he talks about, he uses the phrase building. You are now one building. You think about uh, how a building is built. Each of the parts are, are depending on the other. And that's, that's the idea of the church. That we don't just come to church and have a place here and have a <clears throat> membership here. We become dependent upon one another. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 3 verse 12 says literally, watch after each other so that sin doesn't harm you. We need each other. And Paul says you've been made one building because of Jesus Christ, because God unites. Think about, think about all the stress, all the struggle, all the, the, the backbiting in churches that would go away if we understood this. Think about that. So many churches are known for hating each other, for being at each other's throats. And it's a total, it's a total ignoring of the God who unites. There's a song, and it's a rap song, so some of y'all may not like it. But there's a whole album called 13 Letters where Christian rap artists rap Paul's letters. They're actually really good. But in the one about uh, Corinthians, if you remember in second, or 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it says Christians ought not sue one another. And in the song, he says, when Christians sue one another, it's a slap in the face of the God who gives grace. Because when I sue my, my, my Christian brother, I'm saying God's grace is not enough. And when we act in disunity in the church, what we're saying is God is not a uniting God. And Paul says very clearly, God unites. And so it's important for us to know that. Paul says that God is gracious. This uniting is often unachievable because we get in the way. We either let our own ideas run free, we ignore the things that God says, but Paul says God unites because God is gracious. It comes only through Jesus Christ. Unity in churches does not come because of any shared idea other than the conviction that Jesus is Lord. 
That's the only thing that rises above human sin. You can find some people that you share some interest with. You can find some people that you enjoy being in a group together with. But the only thing that unites sinners, against, sinners that are against each other is Jesus Christ saving them and bringing them above that sin. Think about Paul, who hated Christians to the point of killing them, is now a Christian. He didn't decide on his own to make that change. God changed him because God is gracious and God has united him to his church. Think about Galatians. Paul had to go to Jerusalem to work through issues with the church, right? And they worked through it because God is gracious and God unites his church. So God is gracious. I'm skipping over some things. Paul tells us that God gives faith. This is something else that's important because this is something that has been lost, I think, in the modern church. Faith is not something I have innately on my own that I get to exercise towards God or not towards God. Biblical faith, that, 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 that thing that saves me, comes from God alone. I don't muster it up enough in, in, my, in my soul to choose God. Paul says, no, no, faith, saving faith, comes from God alone. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. Paul has just prayed that they would know who God is, and he says, let me remind you, you were dead in your trespasses and your sins in which you once walked. Now remember, there's, one of those, there's another one of those indications that he's not talking to everybody. He's talking to Christians because he says, your trespasses and sins in which you what? Once walked, implying that you aren't walking that way any longer. So he's talking to Christians. You are dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, that is Satan, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. That's who we are apart from Jesus. Paul holds nothing back. That's who we are. Now remember, if you will, back from Romans chapter 3. Now again, I said last week, none of Paul's letters are meant to be understood alone. All of them build and lock on each other. In Romans 3 verse 11, Paul says, No one is good, no, not one. No one seeks for God. It's like their, like their throats are an open grave, and out of their mouths come, come the, the poison of snakes. This is exactly what he says here. Verse 3, he says, We are dead to God, and we carry out the desires of the body and the mind. Apart from God redeeming the passions of my body and my mind, they are all wicked. They are all sinful. John 3, verse 19, Jesus came into the world and men preferred, men desired darkness. So that's who we are. But then look at verse 4. Paul says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. Now there's a timeline there. Paul's instructing us how we come to be saved. And he's saying you were dead, you hated God, then God moved upon you, and while you were still dead, you became alive because God did it. And he says, by grace you have been saved. And raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages God might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is what? Not your doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand. So Paul is really driving this home. God saves us from front to, from front to back, from start to finish. He actually says it in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. He who began the good work of salvation in you will complete it. And he says where faith comes from here. He says, we have been saved by grace through faith, and this is not your doing. Faith is a gift of God. So if you're here tonight, 
and you would profess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord, that you would profess, Jesus went to the cross and died in my place and rose three days later, that's not because it makes intellectual sense to you. Paul says, understand, God has given you the ability, the desire to believe that. The natural man doesn't believe that. How do we know that? Well, 1 Corinthians 2, Paul says, the things of the spirit don't make any sense to the things of the flesh. All of this fits together. You see how much, how much our eyes are open as we get to know God and we get to know who he is and what he has done. And that's why Paul prays, I pray you know him. I pray you know him. Because it's not up to me to work my way into God's good grace. It's not up to me to exercise enough belief in him. Because do you know what happens when I think I'm the one who has to believe in God to be saved? I'm always doubting if I'm believing enough. I'm always doubting, am I believing enough today? Or I might look back and say, did I, did I really believe back then or was it fake? But Paul says, no, no, assurance of salvation comes from knowing that God saved you, not you. That God worked in you, not that you mustered up enough of your own effort to get there. And so he says, God gives faith. So the first three chapters are just him explaining who God is and how God works and what God has done. So much so that it should embolden us to live faithfully. Do you know once you get a hold of, uh, of a right understanding of God, there's not much that can shake you? There's not much in the world, if anything, that can ultimately shake you if you know who God is. Now, that doesn't mean our emotions don't go up and down. That doesn't mean we don't have worries and anxieties. It doesn't mean that we don't stumble and fall. But what it does mean is when we, begin, when we come to know God as he explains himself through his word, we become steady, sh- assured Christians. So that as we watch our country seemingly fall apart, we know our hope's not in our country. Our hope is in the God who saves and who will never lose me. Our hope is in the God who before the world began knew me and chose me and marked me out. So if God does that, what can death do? That's why in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of of death is sin, but through the cross, God has removed that. He's already taken out the final enemy. And that's why Paul will say later in Philippians, he says, my desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that's far better. Or in in Philippians chapter 3, he says, whatever I have to do to be identified with the suffering Savior, I'll do it because it's worth it. He knows who God is. He knows how God works. And so then he says, what we must do, based on who God is and what he's doing, there's something for you and I to do, which is to live out what God has done to live a life because of what God has done. That should say, now that we know. Now that we know what God is doing, Paul calls upon us to live in light of that. He's made us one in Christ Jesus, and now that unity is to be our daily goal. Daily devotions aren't bad. I hope you use one. There's plenty of good ones out there. But your goal every day as a believer should be to remember who God is and to live out what he's done in your life. God is the God who saves. God saved me. He is saving me today. Not that I'm losing my salvation, but he's working in me today. And I'm called to live for him today. Paul says in chapter 4, verse 1, we're to lead a life worthy. Chapter 4, verse 1, Paul says, I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. There again, he's driving home where salvation comes from. Live a life worthy of the calling to which someone, God, called you. Live a life worthy of that calling. Live it with humility, with gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love. Listen to this, eager to maintain the unity of the Holy Spirit in the bond of peace. That's the daily goal of the Christian. That's the daily goal of the church, that we live out what God has done, that we live out what God 
is doing. Look at verse 17 of chapter 4. He says, now this I say in testifying the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They're darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. If you know your Bible, that ought to be pinging a cross reference from Romans chapter one, where Paul says, when we exchange right worship of God to worship idols, our foolish hearts are darkened and we are made into fools. When I stop worshiping God and I start either worshiping an idol such as money or a job or a person or I make up ideas about God that become an idol and that that happens all the time. When that happens, when that process happens, Paul says in Romans 1, my heart is darkened and I become a fool. Now listen to what he says here. Don't be like the Gentiles because they are darkened in their understanding. They're alienated from the life of God because of what? Ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. Paul's real consistent. He's real consistent across the board. Every idea he has makes sense with and of every other idea. And he's teaching us how to know God and how to understand God. And so he says, Christians, we are to, we are, our lives are to be marked by God's grace, marked by God's gospel, not the way of the world. So yeah, I asked you at the beginning, do you ever think that God, believing in God will cost you something? And it will. It will cost you the ways of the world. And brothers and sisters, we love the ways of the world. We do. That's just our natural bent of our hearts. Apart from Jesus Christ, we love the ways of the world. Which is why back in Romans 7, Paul says, I know the things I should do, and I don't do them. But the things I know I shouldn't do, I end up giving in to them. He says, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And he goes into this wonderful song about praise be to God that God has done it through Jesus Christ. Because we love the ways of the world. And Paul says here, if we don't know what God has done, if we don't know that he elects, that he unifies, that he is gracious, that he's uniting us in Jesus Christ, if we don't know all that, then we will not walk in holiness. We'll walk as the Gentiles do. Our lives will be just like unbelievers when we don't know God. He says the church is to build one another up says this in chapter 4, verse 26. Verse 25, he says, there, Having put away all falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Y'all know anybody who talks behind other people's backs? Just a question. <laughs> Gossip. Unwilling to talk and to confront something to somebody's face, but they will talk about it behind their back. Paul says, Put away falsehood. Speak the truth with your neighbor. Because we belong to each other. Verse 26, be angry and do not sin. Say that again. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your anger. Give no opportunity to the devil. And then he goes on to talk about how the gospel continues to transform us. We are, brothers and sisters, to build each other up. That's our goal. As you look around at the people that God has put you together with in a church, you should say, I I want them to be better in Jesus Christ because of me. Now, I can't actually do that. I, I didn't die for you. I couldn't die for you if I wanted to. I couldn't save you if I wanted to. But by the grace of God and what Jesus is doing in me, I can look at you and say, I can help you be better in Jesus Christ. And Paul says, that ought to be how we look at each other all the time. That ought to be our most fundamental desire. And so Paul's point is that when we know God rightly, when we have the right experience of God's unity, we will have a desire for others to do well. I want you to succeed in your faith. I want you to grow in your faith. I want you to know God. I want you to know your Bible well. I want you to live your Bible out. I want you to stand firm in the face of suffering. I want all of that for you. And you should want that for me. We should want that for each other. And Paul says, that's what, that, that's, why, that's what we do. 
That's what the church is for. That should be what we strive after. We shouldn't get in one long line, shoulder to shoulder, and never look at each other and try to go for something else. Paul says, you ought to just turn and look at your neighbor. That's your work. And none of y'all did that. <laughs> one pastor said that in their church, they encourage each other when they're singing to turn and sing to each other in the pew. To remind, to remind them that God is good and God is gracious and that you need me to remind you God is good and God is gracious. Think we ought to try that someday? It doesn't matter if you can sing. It doesn't matter if you have every Bible verse memorized or not. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, a 50-year Christian or not. We have been called to experience the unity of God and to live out the unity of God. One of my favorite Christian writers says, often the Christ in my brother's heart is stronger than the Christ in my heart. What he means is, a lot of times I struggle to believe and I need some other Christian to come along and tell me, keep believing. I need somebody else to come along and say, I'm here to help. I need somebody else to come along and say, hey, you remember? You remember that verse that was so meaningful to you? You remember that verse that God has used in your life to keep you going? Paul says we need that. He says Christians are to make the most of every opportunity. Chapter 5, verse 15, he says, Look carefully at how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time. But if we're going to do that, it starts with what he says in chapter 5, verse 1. He says, Be imitators of God as beloved children. That's where it starts. If I'm going to make the most use of time, and what he says after that, if I'm going to greet you with songs and hymns and spiritual songs, and if I'm going to build you up, and what he says in, in chapter 5, verse 21, if I'm going to submit to you out of reverence for Christ, it all starts with, am I imitating God? Now, what's got to be true before I can imitate God? <coughs> got to know him, right? <coughs> Just follow what Paul's doing. First three chapters, he says, hey, know God, right? <laughs> know who God is. Act like God acts. What does God do? Well, we can't elect and save. That's God's business. But we can, we can seek unity. We can be gracious. We can encourage and strengthen and build up. So that's what I should give myself to because Paul says right there, I should imitate God. I should walk in love. That's why Paul says to husbands in chapter 5, love, uh, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands, we don't get to be husbands according to however we want to be husbands. God says, I've given you a pattern. And it's a pattern of self-sacrifice that achieves unity and grace and blessing. And it comes from being imitators of God. Paul says we should persevere to the end. Chapter 6, verse 10. Now, I'm skipping over a lot. I know y'all know that. Chapter 6, verse 10, Paul says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. He says we're to persevere to the end. That doesn't happen because I want to. It happens because God gives me faith to. My faith didn't start with me. My faith is not held up by me. God is a God of faithfulness. And God holds me. And so I'm called to stand firm. Christian life is not easy. It's not pain-free. On the contrary, Paul says we are to put on the armor of God. Meaning, life is more like a harsh battle than it is anything else. When you go into work and you face a sharp comment from a coworker or a to-do list a mile long, or you come home after a hard day and all you want to do is sit down, but your family is nagging at you, or you find out some news that you weren't ready to receive, whatever happens that wrecks your life because it happens every day, Paul says, stand firm. And we do that by the word of God. We don't give in to that. We don't give in to our sins because Paul says, don't, don't live like the Gentiles do. You walk in the things of God. You stand firm because God has given us a ground upon which to stand firm. And I said, all this rests in God's sovereignty. All this rests upon knowing that God is in charge, that God is in control. 
Remember where Paul was when he's writing all of this. He's in jail, in chains. In chapter 6, verse 20, he says, I am an ambassador in change. Now, look at what he says. Why is he in prison? What does he say? I'm an ambassador in chains that what? That I may be bold. Think about that thought process. Paul's an old man at this point. He's locked up in a prison cell. And what does he say? I'm in the prison cell to make me bold. I'm suffering to make me bold. God put me here so that I would be bold. He says to do it as I ought to. It's just a rest in the fact that God is in charge. It says in chapter 5, verses 3 through 14, we ought not sin. Because we've been unified with God, we ought not be unified with the world. We ought to put away the things of the world that are unbecoming of a Christian, unbecoming of the way of Christ. And really you could say, Paul is saying, because we are unified with God, we ought not, should not be unified with the world. People in the world unify around all kinds of things. Chapter 5, verse 3, he says, Sexual immorality, all impurity, all covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let no filthiness, no foolish talk, no crude joking, which is out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. People in the world unify around all kinds of sinful things, and Paul says that's not proper among saints, because what we unify around is Jesus Christ. We unify around what God is doing with us, in us, in Jesus Christ. Real quickly, Paul, Paul explains why, why God has done all of this. Why does God elect? Why does God show grace? Why is God merciful? Why does God unite? Why does he call us to a way of living? Well, there's four things that show up. He does it to the praise of his grace. He does it in order to show his grace. He does it in order to display his wisdom to the world. And he does it to bring himself, the triune God, glory forever. Now, you'll notice that we are not in there. (laughs) We are. But God's primary reason for acting is for his own sake. I think one of the greatest statements in Christian writing that's not the Bible is the statement that says, God is uppermost. He's the highest among his own affections. What does God love the most? God. It would be idolatry for him to love anything else more. And to know that God acts for his glory. And when he does that, I benefit tremendously, infinitely, eternally. So just some final thoughts as we close. The church must know her God. That is our first and most important task. If we get that wrong church, then we aren't a church. We will shipwreck ourselves like that, like that ship in the canal. <laughs> that is all we're going to do. We will run aground and get stuck. Our primary task is to know our God. That's why we gather every week to sit beneath the word of God, to put ourselves beneath the word of God. A church that neglects the ministry of the word or does not value it supremely is a church in trouble. Again, think about the churches in Revelation where Jesus says, I'm going to remove your lampstand. You've departed from the things of God. You've departed from the word of God. So I'm going to strip your lampstand from you. And I just make the note, why does Paul deal with these difficult, sometimes controversial doctrines? First, because we need them. We need them for life. We need them for obedience. We need them to know God. Because if we aren't getting our ideas about God from the Bible, we are getting them from somewhere else that's wrong. And so Paul is feeding us what we need. And doctrines only become controversial when we decide that we don't like them. That's one of the hard-hitting things of the Bible. God's not trying to explain to us all the things we like, but hide the things we don't like. He wants us to know him fully. And when I come up against God and I say, I don't like that, I'm the only one that's wrong. That's just how that equation works. And so Paul has given us these things because we need them. We need to know God. We need to know what he's done. We need to know what he's doing so that we can in turn live faithfully as his church. I'm going to pray.
I'll be down front for a minute if you, uh, if you want to talk about anything. But let's pray together. Lord God, we love you. And, and Father, I, I confess for myself and I hope for all here that we stand amazed in your presence. We stand amazed at, Lord, your power, your sovereignty, how you are working out salvation. And Father, remind us that we didn't do anything to earn it. We didn't do anything to achieve it. That if we are in Christ, it is solely because you are a good and faithful and gracious God. And Father, if we are in Christ, I pray, just as you write for us here in the letter to the Ephesians, that we would live it out. As Paul prayed, Lord, help us to know and help us to live it out. May we live lives worthy of the calling to which you have called us. Lord, teach us to stand firm. Keep us standing firm. Thank you for your word. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.